A pleasant day and a warm welcome to your favorite medical discussion I made. Yes, we are discussing certain disease conditions and giving you advices to not to let yourselves in trouble regarding health conditions. But today, specifically this program I made is focusing on a different perspective. So today we are going to interview a prestigious personality. He is a doctor by profession, but he is one of the most important personalities that we can discuss when it comes to the war, the civil war that we encounter. Now it's free. Sri Lanka is a country that we can live freely. These types of personalities has done a lot behind the scene, but we don't know about. So today we are going to discuss with Dr. Gambini Gunatilaka. He is a senior consultant general surgeon and uh, a physician having more than experience of four decades. Thank you very much, sir, for joining with us with this discussion. Thank you, Tarit. So, when it comes to doctors, ordinarily uh, they treat patients, and we are keen on going to doctors and getting medicine. Yeah. So, but uh, you are a different figure. You have portrayed your character, and you have portrayed your experience through the civil war, and you have helped the country a lot. Can you just explain, without moving to that context, the initial days as a budding medical student or a doctor? Did you had any ambition? to expose yourself into this type of a condition? <laughs> Actually, my interest was to first of all to be a doctor and then I qualified the A-level in 1968 and I entered the medical faculty in Colombo and qualified as a doctor in 1973. And then we had to do one year of internship, but my aim was to be a surgeon since my young days. So I had to work towards that goal and it is not an easy task to work to be a surgeon because first of all you need to get your experience, you have to get exposure and then you have to work in certain surgical wards to get experience in different fields. Then you have to work and qualify and pass exams. Now at that time we did not have a postgraduate institute of medicine in Sri Lanka. So part of our training was in Sri Lanka and the rest of it was in United Kingdom. And for that purpose, the government of the health department used to give three years of no pay leave for us to qualify, work and get experience in UK and come back with that qualification, which is called today FRCS, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Now at that time, we studied in medical college or even afterwards when I was training to be a surgeon. It was a very peaceful country. Sri Lanka was a peaceful nation but, and we did not have any lectures or studies or experience in managing war casualties. So this was something quite different to me when I started working after returning from England when I started working in that hospital at Polonnaru, which at that time was called the base hospital Polonnaru. Right. Okay. So you had an ample of experiences <coughs> regard to this. And so when it comes to the year 1973, when you just pass out as a doctor, you had an ambition to be a surgeon. What yeah. type of obstacles did you face in having those so-called experience, exposure and what you ex explained? Yes. Now initially we had to undergo training and I actually wanted to be a general surgeon. At that time, we did not have many specialties. So to be a general surgeon means you must have an idea of operating on any part of the body. Mm -hmm. So I had to work in different surgical units, starting from accident and emergency, thoracic wards, orthopedic wards, and other general surgical wards to get the necessary experience. Because I knew as a general surgeon, he needs to be able to perform surgery on any part of the body, especially in emergency situations. And that is exactly what I encountered when I had started my first job in Polonnaru as the only consultant surgeon in that hospital, serving a population of 260,000 people. And that gave me a lot of exposure, experience, and I came to know the people, the difficulties they had, and I worked for them for six years and four months for a continuous period. 
right so when you just uh, was working so for polona hospital as the only surgeon serving 260000 odd number uh, wasn't it difficult like there there might be a huge queue for surgeries <laughs> and even certain uh, demanding certain um, uh, instances so as the only surgeon how did you manage yeah. that work actually when i started work at the polonaro hospital it was in 1982 just mm -hmm. after i returned from the uk after having worked in a hospital in manchester with all the facilities i was appointed consultant surgeon at base hospital polonaro which was a very primitive type of hospital isn't it the present condition that we yeah, encounter it's not the same condition right. that we see now at that time it was a primitive hospital with very basic investigations only available and there was a shortage of medical officers at that time there were only three specialists mm -hmm. that is a surgeon a physician an obstetrician and gynecologist actually at the initial time there was no medical officers to help me i had to do my work all alone and the other important thing is actually there was no anesthetist as well at that time but under these conditions i decided to work in that place because i was serving a very important group of people in our country those are the farmers who are living in polonnaru who are having a very difficult time and if i left that hospital i don't think there would have been a replacement to help these people at the time of need so i adapted myself i decided to wait there and then improve the hospital with the help of many agencies including jica the japan international cooperation agency who upgraded the operating theater and gave us many more facilities that helped us as regards the medical officers we had a problem because medical officers did not want to come to polonnaru hospital and the department of health had to appeal to the who to get doctors and actually i worked with the burmese doctors for a period of 3 years and they also supplied an anesthetist and that anesthetist was very useful for us at that time to perform surgeries to and perform surgery we right. need an anesthetist so without an anesthetist it's difficult for the surgeon to work right. so with the minimum facilities working in a hospital in manchester in united kingdom with all the state of the art technologies and every facility existed at that time and working here in polonnaruwa bit of a rural and even lacking these primitive conditions uh, you just uh, have done a tremendous work uh, to the benefit of this entire fraternity living in polonnaruwa and sir like you didn't leave the place considering there's these group of individuals this group of people need your support so can you just explain the feedback from the people in that area that yeah. you got actually i worked for in polonnaruwa for a continuous period of 6 years and 4 months i was so happy with the work that i was doing although the conditions and the facilities were not available now under such circumstances when a patient comes i learned in medical school that there are certain things that we must follow first of all we must talk to the patient that is what is called the, the taking of the history of the illness face to face conversation with the patient that gives conf confidence to the patient as well then we must examine the patient and a famous personality by the name of lord platt has said if you talk to the patient long enough he or she will give the diagnosis so that is the principle i followed and in most cases i was able to make a clinical diagnosis proceed with whatever treatment maybe medical treatment maybe surgery sometimes emergency surgery and we went on like that and the people were also happy because if there was no surgeon in that hospital at that time when there is an emergency they would have had to be transferred far away to either matale or kandy by ambulance and that would take 6 to 7 hours and this may mean that some of them would have died on the way which is a very pathetic situation that means you have saved many lives uh, with this minimum infrastructure yes. and facilities and uh, helping them with what you can 
Yeah. And so like uh, in 1982, you returned to Sri Lanka from United Kingdom and uh, it's like a foreign place uh, that you worked with and here a local place. So adopting to these local traditions, the practices and everything, wasn't it difficult? <laughs> it was quite difficult but I had made up my mind that I will stay here and when I started working for these people, I saw so many things that I had not seen as a medical student or as a trainee surgeon. I saw so many different surgical conditions which I thought would be very useful for me as well as if I treat them and save the lives of these people, I would have some satisfaction. And I got a very good exposure during the initial part of my surgical career. And that helped me later on as I progressed from Polon Narua to other hospitals in the country. And say, so if I may ask you, 1983, the war situation yes. with explosions <coughs> and everything, many patients were coming to your hospital and it's like a war situation in your hospital as yes. well. So can you just explain yeah. us? Now actually the war started in 1983 with the explosion of a landmine in Jaffna on the 23rd of July 1983. And the war was confined to the northern part of our country, especially Jaffna at the beginning. But we knew that one day it's going to spread to the eastern province and the border areas of Polon Narua as Polon Narua borders Trincomalee, Batiklo. And we were warned by the army personnel in that area that we should be ready to receive and treat casualties at any moment. But for many, maybe for about uh, one, a, one and a half years, there was no issue. We were continuing with our normal work although there was tension in the border areas where there were a lot of civilians living and the aim of these rebels was to chase them out from the border areas. So anyway, as we were going on, we were expecting problems and one day, that was, on, I can remember, 15th of July 1985, when a landmine exploded at a place called Poonani, when an army jeep belonging to the Singha regiment was traveling from Polonnaru to Batiklo and a landmine laid by the rebels exploded and the, blow, the jeep was blown up to pieces, injuring six soldiers on the spot. And these were brought to the Polonnaru hospital for their treatment. And that was my first exposure of meeting and treating patients with war, what are called war injuries. And that was a tremendous experience because I had never seen such injuries in my life. And, but I had to treat. Three people, three soldiers were dead on admission. Some of their bodies were dismembered. The other three were critically in wounded. And it was my duty to save their lives even under those difficult conditions. And with the help of my team, I saved the life of those three patients. So, so, so how did you cope up with this? Uh, Cumbersome and it's, well, it was like an incredible task that you're performing at the moment, having <laughs> lack of experience in that particular field, but like it's exposing yourself to one of the most onerous tasks as a citizen in the country to help the fellow army soldiers. Yeah. How did you manage mm. it? Actually, I adapted to the situation. I was prepared to meet and overcome challenges and also to take bold decisions. But I had to learn because this is something I did not learn in medical school or during my surgical training. So I had to learn about the management of war injuries. It is a specialty called war surgery. Mm -hmm. War surgery is practiced by military surgeons. But I was not a military surgeon, I am, I am a civilian surgeon. But I had to learn. And how did I learn? At that time in the 1980s, we did not have a library in Polon Narua. We did not have internet, Google to search and learn, read. So I had to go to the Sri Lanka Medical Association Library, read books and journals about the correct principles in the management of war injuries. It is very important under these conditions to give the correct principle in treating these patients. Otherwise, there could be complications, infections, a serious complication like gas, gangrene, tetanus can set in and patients can die. So I learned by reading and I imparted that knowledge to the junior doctors and we worked as a team. And with more and more casualties coming in, with injuries caused by various types of weapons, 
land mines, grenades, bombs, mortar shells, AK-47, T-56, machine guns, a wide variety of patients were exposed to us and I had to do the job by like training on the job, but applying the correct principles in managing these wounds. Right. Training on the job, but you applied correct principles through reading, yes. research, and ample of work out of the scenario that you can just simply just transfer those patients, but considering the risk that they will encounter yes. within the transfer, the time that they will be consuming to transfer to a safer place, yes, you managed to do that. And so, like, uh, it's ordinarily those, like, going to the Sri Lanka Medical Council, this library, and even just exposing your knowledge to your junior medical officers, and, like, it's like easy for a person to say just read and apply principles but it's very difficult when it comes to a certain risk situation a life of a person how do you cope with it <laughs> it is something a, a surgeon should have that uh, idea of going and taking up challenges mm -hmm. that is the main purpose of a surgeon you know surgeon will encounter very critically wounded patients it may be war casualties, it, can, it may be road traffic accidents, it may be some other injuries. So we are exposed to that type of situation and we must be prepared to accept those challenges and make bold decisions, making use of our surgical knowledge. Actually there is something called the basic surgical principles. We have to apply those principles together with the principles that should be applied to managing war casualties. So it is a combination. And the other important thing is sometimes we had patients, not one, sometimes many. Mm -hmm. So under those conditions, it is important to detect the person, the critically wounded. Right. It is a very important principle in managing what is called a disaster situation. Under that situation, it is important to identify the casualty that requires treatment first. Mm -hmm. And that principle is called triage. Right. And that is a French term. Mm -hmm. And that term means, triage in French means sort out. That right. means to sort out the casualty according to the severity of injury and the priority of treatment. If you do not apply that principle which I learnt during my period in Polonnaruwa, many people will die. It is not the first come first served no, basis. No, it is not the first come first served basis. Actually that principle should be applied at the site of the disaster. Mm -hmm. and then the transport of casualties should take place accordingly. So uh, the, the triage officer is the senior doctor in that area. I being the only surgeon, I had to be the senior um, the doctor and Who's I had to be the, the triage. Yeah, triage. So my decision has to be followed by the others. Mm -hmm. So there we have to work as a team. You can't have divisions in such situations. After the disaster situation is over, then we have a discussion and then find out where we went wrong, how mm -hmm. we can improve the care in the, if we have some a situ similar situation later on. Right. So is that communication and discussion between army officials or the uh, entire team of hospital staff? No, or actually when I was in Polonnaru, I was the only surgeon. Mm -hmm. There was no surgeons from the military working in the Polonnaru hospital. Right. But the military supported us in all other aspects mm -hmm. and they what happens is actually when there is a landmine, they will inform us mm -hmm. that there had been a landmine explosion and there is a possibility of receiving casualties. Right. So there was some communication between the hospital and the military. Mm -hmm. They will tell us that certain number of casualties will be coming, so we are ready. So that way we know we can be ready, but there were occasions when casualties just came and came to the hospital without our knowledge. Right. And initially, casualty care was not mm, properly organized. There were times where patients used to come without first aid, mm -hmm. bleeding wounds, sometimes coming in various types of vehicles, not ambulances. Sometimes they came in helicopters. A helicopter would land in a, in a ground close by and then we send the ambulance and get them to hospital. And then we have the hospital ward ready for these casualties and then we apply triage with the support of the other doctors and the nursing staff and then we decide whom to be operated first. 
So that was a teamwork. So this is something I experienced, learned during my stay in Polonaru Hospital. Right. Haven't you been to the war front and just uh, treated patients yeah. with those casualties and everything, sir? No, actually, when I was working in Polonnaruwa, my habit, I had the habit of visiting the front, mm -hmm. even in Polonnaruwa. The front means where sometimes a landmine explosion takes place, because initially it was a guerrilla type of warfare. Mm -hmm. Most of the injuries were caused by landmines. Right. So I used to attend to the casualties and then with the military, go to the site where the landmine explosion took place, you know, and then take photographs of the vehicles damaged, of the craters, and I had a collection of these photographs, so that interested me. And I also used to take photographs of the patients on arrival, mm -hmm. during surgery and after surgery. So by the time I left Polonnaru, I had a tremendous experience in managing these casualties. So now I left Polonnaru in 1988. Mm -hmm. Now by that time, the war was raging in the north and there was a need for more surgeons to go to, uh, to the north to treat the military casualties. Right. And the military appealed to the health department to find out whether there are surgeons who will volunteer to go to the war front. Mm -hmm. Going to the war front means going to Jaffna, right. because that was the war front at that time. And in, in Jaffna itself, in the military camp, mm -hmm. there was a small hospital, and that was called Palali. Right. That ho small hospital was the place where we, are, where we used to go and work mm -hmm. and our job there was to save the lives right. of patients coming with serious injuries to do the basic surgical operation to save life. Mm -hmm. Then we stabilize them and then we transport them to Colombo. So actually we had to go to the war front, it was a risk for us, we are civilians. But I volunteered for the sake of our country and the sake of our soldiers fighting a terrorist war to save their lives. So what we used to do is go for a period of 10 to 14 days. We go by plane from Ratmalana to Palali mm -hmm. and then we land in Palali and then we work in the Palali hospital. So during that period we are within the army premises right. and that was called the high security zone. We mm -hmm. cannot go beyond that. So how is that experience uh, like uh, within working within a high security zone, yeah. uh, guarded by army officials, treating soldiers <laughs> who are critically wounded? Uh, it might be a good experience that a surgeon can have, uh, a limited number of surgeons can have. So what yeah, about your I experience? That I made use of that experience. When they called for surgeons, I volunteered immediately without any hesitation because I wanted to use my experience for the sake of the people who were injured. So, and I also knew that I will get a better experience by going to the war front. And again, I used to go and visit the, the frontline bunkers with the army as they were visiting these areas. So, it was a very good experience for me while working as well as getting an experience of a war-torn area, military camps. You know, different types of operations are taking place, helicopters are flying, you hear the bombs exploding, you hear a battle. And sometimes I used to go in these helicopter gunships with two gunners on either side. And sometimes you see the rebels running away or in vehicles and the gunners are trying to shoot them. So these are all experiences, but <laughs> a risky experience. Right. But Didn't I think you have any what you call obstacles and uh, certain dissatisfactions of your close uh, people to not to go to no, such? No, actually my family members did not at any time tell me not to go because they knew that I was keen to do, go and do some service. Mm -hmm. So I went, when required I went and I did what I was expected to do. Right. And sir, like uh, you said, you had the habit of collecting photographs when patients are coming while treating, after treating, yeah. and uh, with that so you had a good collection of pictures, yes. a good collection of memories, and you turned them into words, and you have authored a beautiful book. Shall we expose yes. that now as well? actually, when I started work in Polonnaro, even before the war started, I had a very small camera which I brought from in England.
-hmm. It is a very small camera, not the sophisticated cameras that are used now. Right. It was called the Olympus Trip 35. Mm -hmm. But that gave me very good pictures and I used to take this camera wherever I go. With, with even when I go to the hospital or in the operating theatre, I have this camera and I used to take photographs. So when the war came, this became very much useful for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I go to Palali as well, I take this camera and I used to take photographs. And I also had records of the patients that I treated. Mm -hmm. So I had both the text available as well as my experiences, how I traveled to Palali, what type of injuries I saw, what mm -hmm. type of weapons were used to cause these injuries, the the, site, the damage at the sites such as landmine explosions. So I had a very good collection of photographs and also my memory helped me to write about my experiences. So actually I put, all, put down all these experiences starting from Polon Narua and authored a book and that book is called The Extra Mile, A Surgeon's Experiences. Some people ask me why I call it The Extra Mile. So I say it is actually the extra mile because I did something which I was not expected to do. Mm -hmm. I went beyond the call of duty because my job was to work in a civil hospital. I had no one could force me to go and work in a military war zone or in a military hospital, but I did that job for the sake of the wounded. So this book is called The Extra Mile where I explain the different types of weapons used the different types of injuries, how these bullets, which are called high velocity bullets, mm -hmm. where the velocity is more than 300 meters per second. That means more than the speed of sound. Yes. So the injuries that we see caused by these high velocity bullets is not the same type of injury that we see in civilian practice. Mm -hmm. You know, before that we used to saw, we saw injuries caused by uh, low velocity weapons such as the revolver, the pistol, shotguns. Mm -hmm. So these injuries are quite different, you know, there's extensive damage to soft tissue, muscle, bone, blood vessels. So that is why the principles are different in managing the two types of injuries. Then in addition to that, we also had injuries caused by explosives. Mm -hmm. Explosives are another very important group in war situation. Explosives are different types, you have the landmines, you have the bombs, you have the grenades, you have the artillery shells, you have what are called the antipersonal mines. All these cause injuries by different mechanisms. Now, if a bomb explodes, you get injuries at the site caused by burns. These are thermal burns. Then there can be shrapnel, which can cause injuries because they penetrate different parts of the body. These shrapnel may be from the bomb itself or the casing of the bomb or even from a building, say a piece of glass building material, all this can cause, penetrate the body and cause injuries. These are called shrapnel wounds. Then we have the injuries caused by the shock wave. When a bomb explodes, there is a high pressure wave created, which spreads very rapidly, causing damage to the body. And that high pressure wave can even cut the body into pieces, like decapitation. Mm -hmm. We have seen patients coming with the head separated from the body or the uh, arm separated from the body. So that is caused by the shock wave. So these are all very serious injuries. Some of them are fatal. Now as the war was going on, they introduced another weapon and that was called the antipersonal mine. Mm -hmm. These are very small mines which they manufactured in the jungle hideouts. What they call this, people will know, it is called the Johnny. Right. The Johnny Butter, mm -hmm. these are manufactured by them, very small uh, box. Mm -hmm. Now a soldier going without knowing that there are antipersonal mines will step on this mine and moment you step it, that electrical circuit is completed and the a spark is given to the explosive and it explodes and the soldier will lose his leg, lose his foot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's disarticulated at the ankle joint. Sometimes they were brought with feet hanging or sometimes at a higher level, hanging with a piece of skin or bone, bleeding wounds. But most of them had needed amputation. Mm -hmm. That means they are disabled for life. And about 80% of these patients in my experience 
had an amputation of their leg below the knee, mm -hmm. which is a permanent disability. Right. And these are young soldiers who had been in service for about six years, one year. And you know, these are not the urban youth who fought this war, they are the rural youth mm -hmm. who lost their limbs for us. And you know, they were so concerned. What they used to tell me is that, please don't cut my leg. But that was the only option available to save that soldier's life. Right. To save him, save his life, I had to do an amputation and save his life. So they were disabled, but again, there is a very important principle called life before limb. Mm -hmm. So we had to save the life before saving the limb. limb. If trying to save the limb, patient will die. Right. So you had many experience, like I was like fascinating and I was not uh, interrupting <laughs> you when you were saying the story. It's like a new source of knowledge that you have created. Medical students, uh, junior doctors and even like uh, you have many juniors and so you have this teaching experience for postgraduate yeah. students and medical students as well. So they will be also following your books as well just to read something out of the what do you call these textbooks and everything. So can you just explain us your, about your teaching experience as yeah. well? Actually, I have started teaching way back in the 1980s when I was in Polon Narua. My first group of doc uh, medical students were students who had qualified to enter medical college from Polon Narua district. Mm -hmm. So during their vacation, they used to come and work with me and I was very keen to help them in whatever way I could. And then from there, I shifted to Gampa and then again, I started te teaching students from the at that time, it was the private medical college in Ragama. Those students followed by the Kalania campus. Then I worked in Gampa for five years and uh, about five and a half years. From there, I shifted to the Sri Jayavardhanapura General Hospital, mm -hmm. where I served for 21 years. That means you shifted from Jaffna to Colombo. Yes. How was that shift? <laughs> sometimes interesting, sometimes not interesting. <laughs> because uh, when I came from Polonnaru to Gampa, I, you know, it was not a, it was cl closer to Kalambu, but you know, I had got used to a different type of surgical experience mm -hmm. where there was a lot of excitement in Polon Naru Hospital, whereas in Gampa it was not so. So that is one reason I also went to Jaffna to use my experience. So when I came to Jayavadnapura, actually I started teaching the students from the Jayavadnapura medical faculty. faculty. Uh, so that I continued for 21 years, 21 batches of medical students, but I have also taught students from other faculties like the Kalambu faculty, Ragama, Jayavadnapura. Then uh, finally, before my retirement in 2014, I was teaching the medical students from the General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University mm -hmm. as their first clinical professor in surgery. So I had a lot of experience and actually I it was a very uh, interesting part of my surgical and medical career as a teacher to impart my knowledge to the medical students. And then I also had the opportunity of training surgeons. Mm -hmm. Those are called the surgical trainees. Right. They come to my ward for training for one year. After they get through the MS part one, they come for training and that is to train them to be good surgeons. Mm -hmm. That was their first appointment, so that is also important. So I have been training and teaching medical students, postgraduate trainees as well. But I also had the opportunity of uh, visiting Jaffna during the time of the war mm -hmm. to the city of Jaffna. That was in 1994. Right. At that time, actually Jaffna was under rebel control. Mm -hmm. The army was confined to Palali that is the high security zone in Palali right. and Elephant Pass. Mm -hmm. By then we had lost the Jaffna Fort as well. Right. So except for the Fort and Elephant Pass camp, the rest of it was all run by the the terrorists. Right. So, so any unforgettable incidents you might have created within that time period? Yes. Sir. Now actually I must tell you why I went to Jaffna. Yes. Why I went to Jaffna was that you know, the Jaffna had a medical faculty which started in 1978. Mm -hmm. With the onset of the war, a lot of lecturers and the staff left Jaffna district. Right. And the Jaffna students were without uh, 
teachers, mm -hmm. but Jaffna Hospital had one surgeon. You know, he was one Dr. Ganesh Ratnam. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of mine, and he was not only the surgeon for the entire Jaffna Peninsula, but also teaching medical students. So he was doing a very big role mm -hmm. in teaching as well as you know doing surgery there. Right. Now he, he called me one day and asked me, Gamini, we want you to come to Jaffna. I actually I got a shock when he told me mm -hmm. to come to Jaffna because I had to go to rebel territory and yes. I am from a different part of the country. Mm -hmm. So he told me there is nothing to worry, you come, we will look after you and the purpose of going there was to be an examiner mm -hmm. for the Jaffna medical students that was in November 1994. Right. So they had arranged for me to go with the ICRC mm -hmm. which means I had to first of all go to uh, Trincomalee by bus get into the ICRC ship at Trincomalee right. and the, the ship will sail in the night and reach Point Pedro mm -hmm. uh, and there was a jetty at Point Pedro. So now this ship cannot go to the jetty anchored in mid sea and then we had to jump on to some boats and go to the Point Pedro jetty and then there were some doctors who were there to meet me and take me to the Jaffna hospital right. and uh, they had arranged my uh, stay in a hotel called Subhash Hotel. Mm -hmm. Subhash Hotel was a very famous hotel at that time right. with 30 rooms mm -hmm. and I was the only guest. <laughs> so I was a bit worried because I am in a you know area controlled by rebels right. and anyway and I am the only single doctor in this area. Mm -hmm. But didn't you face any difficulties The there? rebel newspaper the next day the name called Ilanadan. Mm -hmm. highlighted that a, a single doctor has come to Jaffna after a period of 12 years. Mm -hmm. The first single doctor to come to Jaffna after a period of 12 years is Dr. Gamini Gunatilaka and he is in Jaffna. You so made headlines. Yes, yeah, so that gave papers. the news mm -hmm. and people were aware that I had come there for a purpose and the purpose was to conduct the exam with this my friend Dr. Ganesh Ratnam. Mm -hmm. So we examined 62 medical students from the Jaffna faculty and they were granted the MBBS Jaffna. Some of them may be working here now, some of them may be overseas, but that was the purpose of going to Jaffna. Mm -hmm. And so like uh, by moving to the latter part of the interview, I, I would like to just ask from you, as a senior personality who have dedicated yourself to this war and even being a Sri Lankan citizen dedicating what you can do to the extreme end, what advice can you give to budding doctors, budding surgeons and even medical students might be to the general public? Yeah. Now actually when I when we study in medical college for a period of five years we learn the basics but we cannot stop at that level. After qualifying we do our internship of one year then we get on to working in boards sometimes on our own sometimes under supervision then we decide to specialize in different specialties depending on one's uh, requirement. So what is important is that we must first of all we must know that learning is a continuous process because medicine is a field which is expanding rapidly with new technology, new methods of treatment. So we have to keep up with these new ideas and new methods of treatment and new technologies. Today it is not so difficult like the time I faced when I could not find a book or a library. Today everything is on a, on internet and it, you can read it on your smartphone. So things are available freely. So that is one thing. Secondly, you must know that a doctor must be able to adapt to situations and also accept challenges. He must not get away from challenges. He must face it, be prepared to face challenges and overcome it and that gives a lot of satisfaction and also do not depend too much on high technology. As I mentioned earlier, we must follow the basic steps like taking a good clinical history, examine the patient, do the relevant investigations and have a pattern where we follow and by that we will have confidence with the patient as well as uh, we can take a good history and diagnose the condition. So those are things that I must tell you and thirdly there are three C's that I have always told my medical students 
and the junior doctors who came to my ward, the three C's are very important. And first is care, second is concern, and third is compassion for these patients. Right. Because our job as doctors is to heal, to heal the sick, to relieve the suffering, and to save life. That is our job, and that we must do to the best of our ability, even under diff difficult conditions. Conditions, right. Okay, so thank you very much, sir, Dr. Garmini Gunatilaka, Senior Consultant General Surgeon, and even he, he was the past president of the College of Surgeons, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, sir, for joining with us and sharing your valuable experiences. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a special edition of IMED, so we'll be continuing with the formal procedure from uh, usual programs. Uh, thank you very much for watching us. Stay safe and have a pleasant day.